So let's move on to another revenue stream, and we'll do advertising now. So the advertising uh, revenue stream is actually the single oldest uh, revenue stream in the television business. In the early days, um, advertising actually paid for the entire production cost of the show itself. There were single sponsors. There was things like Texaco Star Theater, um, and in fact, the word soap operas comes from the fact that in the early days, those shows were single sponsored by soap companies. That's where the word soap opera comes from. So advertising today has created a, a much more diverse revenue stream. There's individual 30 second spots. There are a number of different ways to go about it and I'll break those down right now. So the first and single largest is what's called national advertising. Um, and this is you know, pretty obvious what it means, but national advertising means that you're buying an ad across all the entire country and you're reaching an audience inside that channel, whether that's broadcast or on cable. Um, but really, the, the, the big part of this is that the national advertisers pay a higher rate um, and the rate that advertising is sold in is CP. M. CPM stands for cost per, what does the M stand for? Thousand, because of the Roman numerals. I'm getting Roman numeral lessons here, not just television. So CPM is the, that's the currency of the television business, okay? So the CPMs on national advertising are the highest in television, in the television business. Okay? There's another form of national advertising though that pays a lower CPM um, because of the, the, the different way that they buy. So this is called direct response. So direct response are ads that have a phone number or a website at the end of the ads and they are direct response. Um, national advertisers pay a uh, guaranteed CPM. Okay, um, but if the show that they're buying their uh, advertising in doesn't reach the audience that they were promised, they get what's called a make good. Okay, so they, the national advertiser pays a high CPM, but if the show audience doesn't reach the expectations, they basically get a rebate. They don't get their money back, but they get to run additional advertising until they get the number of viewers, the number of impressions that they were promised by the network. Direct response pays a much lower CPM, but they do not get make goods. They don't get guarantees. They're not guarantee a certain level of audience. They're guaranteed a certain kind of audience, so they know who they're buying, but there's no promise by the network on the number of impressions that are going to be generated. Okay? And then, and I'm not going to get into the, every aspect of the advertising business here, just the biggest chunks. The, another big, big chunk here is local. Okay, so now local breaks down in a number of different ways. Um, you know, on the broadcast side, uh, you have NBC and CBS and ABC, but then you have your local um, broadcast affiliate, that station in your town that has the news of the night in the local. They do the weather, they do the sports, you know, they are WNBC or KNBC or, you know, the, the local station with your local anchors and all that happy chat. So th that's the local station and they sell a different whole portion of, of the day. Um, uh, advertising to advertisers. On the cable side, you have the local cable system. So you have the national cable system, Comcast, which has pockets, regional pockets all over the country. Um, and then they get a section of time per hour that they are allowed to sell for local advertising. So you'll, let's say you're watching your favorite television show. So let's say your favorite television show is The Colbert Report. Um, inside that show, what you'll find is most of the advertising time, or uh, well, if this is the show itself, um, uh, of the uh, 30 minutes of television time, uh, around 22 minutes is program. The other eight minutes is some combination of advertising or promotion for that network. So Comedy Central will run their promos. but then you will also see national advertising. What you will also see is a little direct response, but you'll see about one minute per every half hour. So one minute for every 30 or two minutes for every hour will be given back to the MVPD to sell on a local basis. That's why when you're watching Colbert Report, you'll see 
a national uh, commercial for a car company, and then it'll be followed by a commercial for Pete's Pizza, which is right down the street for you. And what happens is the national programmer, the, the network, sends what's called a tone to the MVPD's local affiliate. And that tells the local affiliate that it's time to put in your local commercial. So that's how the local television business. These are lower CPNs than all these others. Okay, really quickly, here's my little do-rag. The last one, or the last one I'm going to talk about, um, is called branded entertainment. Now, branded entertainment is mostly a national advertising. Never see it for direct response. And branded entertainment is this kind of stuff that say, let's say you're watching The Real Housewives and then they break and you see the Real Housewives talking about a product. Or actually, you know who does this really well is uh, Top Chef. Um, you know, they'll, you'll see inside the show uh, a certain brand of knives. Um, but you'll also see branded entertainment like uh, long piece, long form uh, commercials starring the talent uh, on a given network. Brand entertainment can actually take any number of different forms and it takes a long time to sell. It's much more difficult to make. You know, a national advertiser takes a 30 second spot and they plunk it into one of these breaks. That's an easy transaction. Brand entertainment takes a long time to sell to the advertising agency and then the programmer or the network or the producer actually has to make that brand entertainment. And that's why it's actually probably one of the highest CPMs out there. You don't necessarily get a guarantee um, for brand entertainment. What you get is content connected to the program um, that it's inside. Now there's a lot of evidence that this type of advertising is also the most effective because it's connecting directly to the content that the consumers come to watch. Um, it's a high engagement, high cost, but it's not necessarily what we would call scalable all the time. But this is a very, very fast growing segment. And this, you know, this is about 98% of the television advertising that you're going to see out there. So next I'm going to talk about how we measure the advertising and how the advertiser knows that they're getting their value. So you'll remember we talked about CPMs as the currency of the, uh, the television advertising business. Now, CPMs are cost per thousand. Um, the, the, the question is how do you measure those thousand? Who measures those thousand? The answer is really one company measures the vast majority of advertising and, and audience data out there. And that data is driven by a company called Nielsen. So Nielsen is a, a measurement company. They've been the, the it's actually called AC Nielsen Company. It was founded by a guy named AC Nielsen a long, long time ago. And they are really the single most important measurement company in all of television. Um, what's interesting is that they use around, and I, I am generalizing here, so don't necessarily hold me to this, although this is up on the internet so everybody can watch it and come back at me. But they use a, a universe of around 25,000 homes to create a sample large enough to tell us Who's watching what in America? So how do they do that? This is how they do that. So there are 116 million television homes. Okay? So that's the universe. Now, a rating is done usually in a, 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 a 1.0 or a 0.56. They're decimal points. So a 1.0 rating, this is called a household rating, household rating. A 1.0 household rating on a total universe of 116 million homes equals basically 1.16 households. So 1.0 rating is 1. million 1.16 million households. So when you see a rating, a household rating, and it demonstrates this, it's basically a percentage. It means 1% of the overall universe has watched. And so you just do the basic math and you get the percentage. Now, what's interesting, this is households, okay? People don't usually sell advertising in households. They sell by what's called demos. And demos are sections of the populace by age and sex. So. The most popular, the most valuable demo is the 18 to 49 demo. This is what you will hear. When uh, CBS usually wins households, Fox usually wins 
18 to 49. This is the most valuable demo out there. So usually when a, when a show wins a night or you're talking about a popular show, you're talking about the number of adults, 18 to 49. So th what's interesting is because every household is more than one person. So one household could be three people, could be four people. Um, the size of the universe of 18 to 49 is around 132 million people, adults, 18 to 49. So it's different. It's a different universe. So a 1.0 rating against this demo means 1.32, let's do it over here, 1.32 million adults 18 to 49. Now, if you sell households, you get one CPM. The more specific you get as far as the demo that you sell, the more valuable it is to the advertiser because they're targeting a specific demography. Okay, So if you're targeting 18 to 49s and you're selling against 18 to 49s, you get a higher CPM than if you're just selling households or a larger audience. Um, if you get more specific, let's say women 18 to 49, oops. So women 18 to 49, um, there is an available universe of around 65 or 66 million women to 18 to 49. So a 1.0 against women 18 to 49 would be around 650,000 women 18 to 49. You can do a much smaller number against this much slimmer demographic because it's more targeted and therefore your CPMs are, are um, are higher. So let's go to a different demographic. Um, actually, a very, 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 very valuable demographic because it's incredibly hard to reach. 18 adults, 18 to 34. In 18 to 34, there are around, again, around 67, 68 million people in that d demo. So a, a 1.0 against this demo would be around 680,000 adults, 18 to 34. This is very valuable audience because it's a very hard audience to reach on any medium, but specifically on television, because they do disintermediate. And that word means they shift. They time shift. They move onto different devices. So when you can reach a really big audience in the 18 to 34 demographic, you can charge a very high CPM. A great example of that would be Adult Swim. They get a very, very large block of this very, very specific audience, um, and they get them live because the, sh the shows that they run on Adult Swim are on very late at night, and people tend to watch them live as opposed to recording them and watching them later. That, therefore, a network like Adult Swim can charge a very high CPM for this audience. Even though it may be smaller, it's much more valuable because it's very targeted and very hard to reach. Now, we'll move on and we'll talk to how technology has influenced the way it's been, the audiences have been measured and the way networks transact with the advertisers. So technology, remember when we go back to the multi-channel and the post-network era, you've got DVR, you've got time shifting, you've got space shifting, um, you've got VOD, video on demand. Um, so there are a number of different ways for audiences to watch programming and it's not entirely um, friendly to the advertiser. So as the DVR, um, which is now in about 44% of homes, Okay, so DVR homes is 44% of homes. So it's not 100% of the universe, but it tends to be the much more upscale, um, urban, um, and uh, really valuable audiences out there. So time shifting has become a real problem for the advertising industry. So around five or six years ago, there was a major shift in the way measurement happened. So let me back up 10 seconds. There are a number of different ways Nielsen measures viewing. There's live. That's the number of people watching it while it airs. There's live plus same day. Now live plus same day is anyone who watches the show even seconds after it started live. So if you just hit pause once, you're live same day. If you hit pause a number of times, you're live same day. But if you watch this within 24 hours, so even if you record it and then watch it 24 hours later, you're live same day. If you watch it within um, three days, you're live plus three. And if you watch it um, within seven days, you're live plus seven. And then there's even a measurement for live plus 30. Okay? So as the DVR became more and more pervasive, 
the cable networks and the advertisers disagreed on how to measure the audience. Should I value only live? Should I value only live same day? Should I value live plus three? Should I value live plus seven? The programmers really wanted to try to do something in here, live seven to live, live uh, 30. Um, the advertisers wanted to do stuff that was live or live same day. The compromise was something that was spun off of live plus three, but the advertisers said, well, what happens if someone watches the show within two days but doesn't want what but fast forwards through the commercials I don't want to have to pay for them so what wound up being the compromise is what's called C3 and this was a major uh, compromise in the industry what this is is the number of people who watch the show live plus three so within three days but who stay tuned for the commercials so this is a commercial rating. They pay only for the people who watch within three days and watch the commercials. So you could have a very, very large live plus three number um, because people, let's say people record it. And there are a lot of shows out there that increase 100%, especially on cable, 100 or more percent live plus live three. So you, you, know, you could have, let's say, let's say 300,000 people watch a show live. And then over the ensuing couple of days, another 200 people watch, 200,000 people. So now your new number is 500,000. Okay, but 20% of that drops out of the commercials because they fast forward the commercials. So your new number, your C3, would be 400,000 people. So that's 400,000 people translated to a CPM, cost per thousand, or cost per per 40,000 thousands your C3 number would be 400 and then you multiply that times your CPM and you get the advertising rate for that show. Shows vary. Shows like uh, Real Housewives and the shows on Adult Swim have a very high C3. Um, they retain or actually sometimes even cr increase their audiences over live onto C3. Other shows don't do as well. Depends really on the channel, depends on the time of day, depends on, on the show itself. So this is really how the measurement, this is a very complicated uh, set of data here. Um, but this is how um, advertisers and programmers measure audiences and how that translates into revenue. So now we're going to move from the advertising uh, revenue stream into the syndication revenue stream. Syndication means taking a show off its original program home, its network, and putting it somewhere else. That's not the actual specific definition, but that's close enough for jazz. So syndication can come in really two basic forms that I see right now, but everyone's definition of syndication is a little bit different. Sometimes some of the things that people put into syndication I put into licensing. Some of the things that I put into licensing other people put in syndication. So I'm going to use my definitions and I'll cover most of the bases I hope. But syndication comes into one of two um, different ways for me. There's traditional and traditional syndication is something that most of us have seen over and over and over again. So you're watching your local uh, broadcast affiliate or you're watching a cable channel and you see a show that originally aired somewhere else on this channel in what most people call repeats. So you're watching your local Fox broadcast affiliate and at 7 o'clock in the afternoon Friends comes on or Two and a Half Men comes on, or the most popular syndicated show right now, Big Bang Theory, comes on. That's a show that's been syndicated. CBS ran Big Bang Theory and still runs Big Bang Theory in its original form, and then a company, a company usually owned by whoever um, broadcast that show originally, in, the case, in this case CBS Sales, takes it and syndicates it. They sell it to local affiliates or sometimes cable networks. So right now I think TBS is running Big Bang Theory and they're doing quite well with it. That's syndication. So in this case, TBS pays CBS a syndication fee for each episode of Big Bang Theory. 
And in exchange, oftentimes, again, I'll go back to this wheel. Remember this wheel? So if this is 22 minutes, okay, and eight of it goes to uh, promo or advertising or local, um, oftentimes the original syndicator, the one who created the show, will take a minute for themselves or 30 seconds for themselves as part of the deal. So the fees actually sometimes get mitigated by this kind of barter exchange. But generally speaking, what you have is the syndicator charging the syndicatee or the new network a fee for every episode. And these things can get very, very expensive. So for example, Family Guy, which is probably one of the most popular syndicated shows out right now, it originated on Fox. They syndicated it actually to Adult Swim. The show had been canceled. Adult Swim put it on and it became so popular so fast that Fox actually put it back into production and brought it back to the network. And now you'll see that show pretty much everywhere. You see it on TBS, uh, you see it on Adult Swim, you see it on a number of different local networks. I um, mean, that generates um, Fox, in this case, uh, News Corp, a tremendous amount of syndication revenue. Um, the fees for that one show alone are in the tens and, and actually hundreds of millions of dollars because they've made so many episodes um, and they run so often and so many people are running them that hundreds of million dollars comes into the syndicator on a yearly basis. And um, what you have there is a critical mass of revenues coming back for a show that perhaps isn't necessarily as profitable in its original form, but because it's got a long tail, it has a number of episodes, um, it generates revenue. The key number here is 100. Usually it takes around 100 episodes for a show to become uh, viable as a syndication device. The reason for that is, is you want to be able to put it on in what's called a strip. You want to be able to run it. If you watch Big Bang Theory or Family Guy on a network, it, it runs usually the same time every night or the same night every week. And that's what's called either a vertical strip or, I'm sorry, either a horizontal strip, got my directions wrong, or a vertical strip. The other kind of syndication and this is what I put into syndication, is what's called OTT. So I mentioned this before. OTT is over the top. And what this is, is companies like Netflix, Hulu, Amazon, and others who um, license a show or take a syndication fee for a show um, and then they sell it on what's called subscription video on demand. These are not individual sales like iTunes, which I'll get to in a second, um, but this is Netflix, which you pay a monthly fee to and get an all-you-can-eat experience on their platform. Same thing with Hulu Plus and Amazon, Amazon Prime. This is a relatively new advent in the television business, but it's become a very, very big revenue generator for a lot of programmers. So when you go and you watch 25 episodes of Breaking Bad or Mad Men uh, or um, Arrested Development on Netflix, um, there's been a f one large fee paid by Netflix to the original programmer um, as opposed to a per episode uh, uh, renewal basis um, that, that is more traditional in, in the regular syndication. This is a brand new type of syndication and it has been very important um, to the um, television business because home video um, you know, the DVD business is decreasing greatly every year. It still exists, but the physical product itself is probably going to go away over a relatively, you know, not much time left in that business, I would say. Um, because the digital product is such, so much more convenient, gives so much more control to the consumer. So these are the two basic areas of syndication the way that I see them. Now I'm going to move from syndication to a different port, uh, part of the licensing revenues, or what I call straight licensing.